I will just say thank you to the collaboration of all the different regional libraries that has made this possible because it's great to have authors who may not normally travel, you know, everywhere all over the place to, to talk in front of an audience. And on that note, this collaboration has made it possible to have an online chat with our feature author, Sophie it. Laguna. Welcome, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you. Now, just a reminder for everyone to make sure their microphones are off so we're not hearing any noises. Vicky, thanks for the introduction for both Sophie and myself. I'm just going to jump straight into questions with you, Sophie. Great. As Vicky said, you've got a great track record of very impressive writing, you know, across, across both children's and adults. But I did want to focus more on Infinite Splendours mm. tonight, although I'd love to chat about the children's books a bit later too. Right. Now, Vicky mentioned that your, back, your background was acting, which mm -hmm. I knew, and, and that's why I wanted to start with asking mm -hmm. you about, I guess I've heard in another interview mm -hmm. that you began this book with a monologue, sort of just getting a monologue together and, and, mm -hmm. and making that the way that I guess you sort of visualise the character. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering in what ways your acting and performance background does generally help you as a writer when mm -hmm. you are to bring a character to life and, and how it helped in this case. Mm. Tell us about the monologue. It, it's hard to, you know, it, it's hard to sort of give neat answers to, to, to these questions because, um, you know, I did train as an actor and I did work as an actor for a lot of years and was passionately interested in acting. So I think that that approach comes quite, quite naturally. So I can't remember which lesson it was that I learned, but you're right, I must have absorbed all of that. I must have absorbed working in that way. It's, it's hard to tell the chicken or the egg, you know, because it is very natural to me to come at things character first. And that's what gives me energy and joy. And that's, that, that, that I have a lot of natural drive around inhabiting a character. So, but, but you're right, you know, all of those years of working with, with with play scripts and dialogue and scenes must have I must have absorbed it you know I, I must have because we we absorb everything we're learning and and that we're immersed in um so um Lawrence I think like like a number of my my books really um did as you say begin um you know I did begin in that first person voice like a monologue and it is like being, it's the closest thing to being in character. It's the closest what thing that, in character, sorry. yeah. I was just wondering what it looks like, though, or I guess yeah. maybe sounds like. Like, do you start speaking it, sort of pacing around the room, finding the voice, or are you starting on the page? Um, I, I st I'm starting on the page. Yep. I'm starting on the page, and it's, um, it's happening on the inside. On occasion, I will move something move a difficult scene or or speak the line but it um i've heard writing described as a kind of inner performance and that's about the closest or that has felt the most accurate description i've heard for the for, for what it's like to to be to be engaged in um it, it, it yeah it, it just happens on the inside and moves quite naturally through my hand i mean it's not true you know it will begin as a character but at the very same time as beginning in character, there tends to be a central idea also that emerges very quickly that will define who that character is. So from the very first pages and or paragraphs, um, I will know there'll be some sort of central problem which will be the heart of what that novel is. So even though I've described the process as, as loose, all of these ha things are happening at the very same time. Uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, a, a plot will be rapidly unfolding before my very eyes, if you like. Now, I imagine there's some people in the chat tonight that haven't read Infinite Splendours and perhaps want to get some sort of sense of what it's about to encourage them to read it. Maybe they've read some of your other books. We don't want to give away any, you know, kind of entire spoilers, obviously. But tell us a little bit about that central idea that started germinating. Well, yeah, so, um, you know, you're right. I began with the character Lawrence Lohman. So it's a character-driven novel. The protagonist, his name is Lawrence. 
And when the story opens, Lawrence is only 10. However, when I first encountered him, he was already in his mid 50s and he had a, an inclination from time to time to um, go underground, to disappear into a kind of or hide in a, in a kind of bunker space uh, um, that was somewhere on his property, literally, physically. That was the first idea that came in those early paragraphs. And from there, I had to make choices or decisions about why would, why would a man need to do something so extreme? I was curious about it. It held some mystery. It was, I understood it was very dark, but I was curious because it was also a way of being held by, by the earth and it brought the man relief. And I thought, relief from what? And I was frightened by it. I don't mean that absolutely. I just mean it was, it's such an unsettling, unsettling complex idea. And that's interesting. That's interesting to me. And it, there was a lot of energy around it. So, um, I, of course, I suspected that the trauma lay in childhood. So if, if trauma great enough to send a person underground for periods of time, I suspected had its roots in childhood. Well, at least in the case of this man, it did. And I find that really fascinating as a writer and as a reader because I guess many people might assume that you started with the idea of the child and exactly what had happened and then figured out what that would become in an adult. But yeah. doing it in reverse seems so much more interesting. And interesting yeah. Because it's, it's a journey that you went on. Yeah, I did. I did. Um, so I, I wish I'd written down, I always regret this, Claire, that I don't have a little journal in which I describe the writing process. So in when I'm questioned, I can remember how much of his adult life had I developed before I went back. I'd written, I think I wrote quite a lot of it um, before I began at the beginning. And, and then, so you asked originally the, the story. The story opens when Lawrence is a, a boy of 10 living um, with his mother and his brother in a pretty close family unit, you'd have to say, not perfect. Um, you know, his father was killed in the war. So um, that's a loss in his life, but he has not had a father since he's two and he's really bonded with his brother, Paul. He has a good self-esteem. He really, um, he's thriving in school. He has a couple of teachers along the way that, that encourage him. He loves painting. He discovers early in the book an incredible natural is the word natural affinity and uh, for painting mm, he yeah responds passionately in fact the first time he paints with his teacher um it, it's as if he, he he disappears for a little while there time stops he, he loses himself in the paint and in the image that he's painting which i think is the clouds or the sky and the treetops and um so he's open to life he loves the mountain range under which he lives at the base of a mountain called Mount Wallace, particularly um, the Grampian, the Southern Grampian mountain range. He responds to nature. He, he, he's open. He's a loving boy. He's a happy, he's a happy boy. There's so much in there that I want to dig into more, the yeah. sibling relationships, the yeah. dysfunction, the yeah. art, the teacher. I'm going to go with the art first because it really is his salvation and, and as you said painting is his chosen medium mm. I'm just wondering what your own connection to painting and art is specifically and and how did writing this book maybe change your own connection to to what painting and art can can give somebody my mother's an artist so so and my husband's an artist um uh, uh, so so you know I wonder you know is it it was it those is it those influences um, I'm not an artist, I'm a writer, but there are parallels, I think. Um, there are parallels. So it's, a, it's just, um, I think, I can imagine, I, I imagine, and I, I believe that, that there are parallels. So the obsession is, this, is, I can relate to the obsession, the immersion, the way he drifts over his painting at a certain hour in the day when the bulk of the work is behind him he drinks a beer he says even beer is in service of painting and he doesn't art at that time he just looks in a very loose way at the work I love doing that and all sorts of 
wonderful things appear to him. He enjoys it. He loves colour. I, lo I love painting. I love looking at painting is what I mean. I mean, that's a, such sounds such an obvious sort of thing to say. I don't get to do it often enough. In a different world without children. <laughs> I might, Ah, the world yeah. without children. You know? Um, I, I live Remember. A, yeah. I, I live a practical life, an ordinary sort of a busy life at school and keeping the house tidy, you know, ordinary stuff. So um, works like Infinite Splendors give me an opportunity to um, actually be investigating something um, other and deeply interesting and um, complex. And um, so, you know, back to, though, Claire, your original question, we have to tell, for readers who don't know the story, a 10-year-old boy living well enough, happily, when um, mother has some ghosts in her past that she does. She's not um, a fully open woman. She, she finds intimacy difficult, but she's, she's a consistent. They have a terrific neighbour. And then um, her long lost brother comes to visit, Reggie. And from there, everything, everything changes. And I, I don't think that's giving away too much to, no. to talk about something very serious that takes the very damaging that happens. Um, and from that point, the protagonist is changed. And we then, uh, we see how he, how he changes and what he does with the damage that takes place. And the rest of the story is um, the unfolding of, of those of the consequences. Would you? Is that a good way to? Yeah, no, that, that's the, the ripple, brilliant way to the describe that. that. <laughs> yeah, the ripples of the betrayal that he suffers. Yeah. I'm interested again. You know, we were talking about that idea that you started with the adult and then you went back yeah. to explore the child that he was before that happened and, and what made that happen. How easy is it for you? And and sort of what tools do you use to go back? into that childhood which you capture so perfectly the the you know the the complexity and the innocence of, of, of childhood and the way you know perspective is and how how it can be changed so dramatically are you drawing on your own memories of childhood your writer's imagination looking at your own children now and the ages they are or is it just that combination of, of I, all think of that I think it's a combination of all of it because it's not particularly conscious. So I don't know what the tools are, but that must be all three of those. Um, something about, like, there's some emotional truth I know. I must know some emotional truth. I using my I'm using my imagination. So um, I'm, I'm getting to know him um, sentence by sentence. So um, each sentence, uh, is, is you are bonding further so each sentence is more thought and more time with an imaginary character so each sentence they're becoming more real and so then you've imagined them let's say you're working every single day and as you're writing the sentence you're there you're, he's 10 years old he's riding his bicycle say the scene is his brother's there ahead of him school bag up and down legs pushing on the pedals familiar, warm, you know, the mountain is there, they're on the way to school, they sing, they muck around. So it sent, you're there more and more and more of the time and sent, um, ideas and love of character breeds more love of character and more detail and then um, you're really invested, you really love and you're really know, knowing their history and, you know, what, what, what food was it that they had when they rushed through at the end of the school day and, their mother's face and the birthday present that they got and what they did and how it felt. And it, 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 it's the work of imagining and time spent and then crafting that comes later. Um, it, it's, I mean, I think he was the first person voice. So it's being in character. So you're in character the same way someone who pretends on, on a stage or, I'm not, you know, or, or behind a camera, I suppose. They put that hat on and they change the voice and they see the world through those eyes and all sorts of spontaneous um, things take place. Um, and then you throw, you throw these, you know, 
grenades of dysfunction in. Like, like you say, the sibling relationship, there is so much in the familiar and the innocent and the loving and, and the yeah. bike ride and the singing and the mucking around. Yeah. But that yeah. sibling relationship is also yeah. forever changed and impacted yeah. by what happens yeah. in, in this childhood. Yeah. Tell yeah. us about that and what, what draws you to that, you know, especially that yeah. sibling rivalry yeah. resentment love and, and how quickly it can go from one to yeah. the other yeah i like the way you put that i throw a grenade i set up idea you know the ideal and then throw a grenade but you know i want a writing teacher once said to me early on because i studied the, uh, the diploma in professional writing at rmit and i remember they said as soon as you set up an ideal you know when you begin with an ideal or, or something ideal an idyllic scene well, that's tense reading straight away because there's only one way for that to go, for a story to hold, isn't there? You yeah, know? to have that any interest. interest. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, uh, that's the happy ending. And yeah. nobody yes, that, really. something's going to go. So if you draw it well enough and it's precious enough and it's vulnerable enough, that's already very dangerous. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe I'm cheating in a way because if characters are young, they are more vulnerable. And that's worrying for, for a person on the outside because if you care for them, there's, the stakes are high and the stakes are high with children. And, um, you know, if, if you're the reader coming from outside, you, you'll be, you know, a part of you outside judging and, and caring and concerned and a part of you inside experiencing it for yourself. That, you know, I think that's what happens when we read, isn't it, where both outside and we're in we're inside but that wasn't that wasn't the question you asked you asked no me, the question was why that, you're particularly fascinated with oh, this yeah why would i do that the pain of siblings yeah um, a great question why am i for goodness sakes why can't i just they were getting on perfectly well things were going well i could sometimes it will occur to me i'll, I'll be writing and i think why don't i just before he comes couldn't i just stop it there and the teacher's just really great at his school and he studies painting and he moves to a big city, Melbourne, and he does well and he forms a great, why do I, you know, I could, could have done that, couldn't I? I could have written that book. And he, and he goes on and he, he, he thrives at university and, um, you know, maybe has a few setbacks. I didn't write that book, I, but I, that's not the point. That, that's not the point of the story. Then I'm not showing in the way that I need to show the redemptive, powers of of painting I'm not doing what I need to do which is showing the light in the darkness showing strength of character showing resilience I'm doing something different that's more interesting to me more extreme in some ways yes you um, um I you ask why do I you know sabotage that 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 sibling relationship um well it's a great question I mean a lot of my impulses are unconscious I don't ask myself why I just do what comes on the page coming it's coming along on the page sentence is by sentence i'm being that's what i'm doing and so i if it's a lot of energy there i won't question it i'll keep going i mean i could question it now maybe it's an investigation of my own complex sibling relationships maybe i'm looking and looking and looking again at siblings um yeah why did i do it why did i why did I do it that way? Um, I mean, I, Paul never stopped loving him. They never stopped loving each other. It was heartbreaking. Um, maybe I'm showing that in a way they remain loyal to each other, but it is pretty heartbreaking, isn't it? Maybe in another 10 years I'll write different sorts of books. Maybe. Maybe do we not. want? Maybe. Do we want you to? Yeah, maybe, maybe, we'll maybe not. Decide. I mean, so, so, you know, I didn't come myself from. Um, I don't know that that world where it all goes well and everyone meets happily, and you know, it's all much more complex. In my understanding, my experience, as well. And you've mentioned the teacher a couple of times. Who, yeah. you know, as a character, is a great yeah. tool to sort of. Yeah reconnect him you know even in terrible times with with what beauty is and, yeah. and what you know where to, how, how to sort of tap into that um yeah. that that salvation that creativity does yeah. offer 
but whether that's through painting or in the words of a book uh, and the book you chose in this that the teacher yeah. reads to the class that's and right. young Lawrence is Robinson Crusoe. That's right. Tell us oh. about that. Well, if I analyse it, you know, after again, I won't consciously examine. It'll appear. And I don't want it to sound magical. It's not magical. Like I'm working and it'll go, what book, what book? Go, Robinson Crusoe. It'll just come. Like it's not a big deal. I don't research it for 16 weeks. Yeah, it just comes. If it fits, I'll keep it. You know, if I picked Black Beauty, I'd probably go, nah, the horses, it's not worth, nah. You know, it fits, it sits, it just boom, lands. It's, in, it's, intu it's intuitive. The choices are intuitive. And, um, and then I'll make um, sense of well, what, a good, good, what a good choice because he's a very isolated guy <laughs> stuck on that island and it's perilous the journey and um, I, I'll think that's a handy metaphor and I'll develop it and it'll stick around. And so um, and there'll be great quotes I can take and I won't have to worry about copyright. So which is time. always important yeah so and um and i'll enjoy it i'll enjoy it i'll be enjoying it that's why i'm doing it because i'm enjoying the ideas and the way it lends itself so easily to lawrence's own story and, it's and did, yeah did you have a teacher that that inspired you similarly that... i probably had few a few over the years or moments i probably yeah. had moments and i liked school I know that's probably not a very popular thing to say in a way. I responded well. It was a kind of um, a safe place, a, sa a place that made quite good sense, actually. I liked it, yeah. Now, you've mentioned it in a couple of different ways too, you know, the landscape, which yeah, the really in this book is, is like yeah. a character. You mentioned the Mount yeah. Wallace. You mentioned at the heaven. start, you know, him seeking refuge kind yeah. of, you know, in this bunk heaven. Yeah. close to the earth. So tell us about the landscape, how important it was to get it right in this book and why you chose the kind of setting you did, which I guess is, is, is the Grampians, but you've... Yeah. Not use mountains with their proper names. You've kind yeah. of Wallace. Wallace was, it. Yeah, Wallace was recast so yeah. that I could take liberties. Um, well, I'd done the river in the choke, so I needed a yeah. change. And <laughs> I needed, needed somewhere th not too far from home I could get to. It made perfect sense. I would just got my finger and pointed, where's a mountain range? There, the Grampians. I've never been there. So um, I drove there and found it and the novel was already taking root so my imagination was very active and it would I would go and visit without the kids and that was that's always rare for me not to be at home you know it doesn't happen that much and so it's exciting and the story was cooking away and then I would climb the mountain and the mists would descend on the rain and the you know the emus or kangaroos or whatever it else you know the mountain itself the views everything fed the story the story fed everything it was like being high it was like being high a lot of the time um and the a, writing process around that are you sort of you know snap snap or just I did do a bit of mind taking yeah. the photos or, yeah, it's the or mind writing the, the photos yeah i did yeah. take some i thought this is look, this is what sensible people do they research <laughs> take photos look at me i'm doing a two click <laughs> See research. <laughs> but once but you were there, though, you must have realised it was more than mere, you know, the proximity of geography. It's a, it's it's got its own unique characteristics. Oh, so what, yeah. Tell us about why you felt that suited this story and 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 the emotion and that and the well, it, it's not that it suited. It's that this story unfolded in this way as a consequence of. Yeah. Uh, my relationship or Lawrence's relationship with Wallace deepened. He became this fantastic sort of custodian, um, father figure. Um, I think mountains are like that for people. I, I bet if I did a whole lot of research into, um, well, of course, the way First Nations people have responded to mountains in their worlds, um, the same I responded, you know, and uh he he felt like there was they, 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 he had a spirit it was as if he had a spirit and um and, and it developed you know each time i would go and stay there 
you know, I probably made uh, maybe six times I visited. That's a lot for me. You know, three nights at a go and I would walk by myself, completely unsafe, no supplies, no map, no water, freaking mum out from the top of the mountain. Mum, I can't find the path! <laughs> you know, and, and my imagination and I just, I just absolutely... Then I would come down, I would write the novel all from 6 a.m. in the morning until four at night and then drink a glass of red wine and think about it more. And it, it was intoxicating and deepening. And, and um, I came to know Hamilton, the little town and the drive between Hamilton and Dunkeld and all the names of the farms. And um, I learned that there was a dairy farm that was very convenient. I wanted him working in the dairy, as you know. He, he, and I grew up on a dairy, on a converted dairy farm and milked a cow myself. You know, I, I milked our cow frequently. Um, so all of those things came into the story. Is that the intensity of your writing process with every book, that sort of 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., glass of red wine, go back the next day, or does it look different? Yeah, that sounds pretty good. That's <laughs> ideal, but it's all had to change. I mean, kids... So that's when I go away, you know. I yeah. don't have, have any other concerns. So that's why I say 6 a.m., you know, um, then I'll just pick it up and start and work immediately. I don't have to do anything. Make those, you know, very small cups of hotel room tea and, and just work. It's great. And then go for a walk and then keep going in a bakery, you know, keep going, keep going. or And then, yeah, a glass of wine, keep going. I, I don't work at night much. So I probably, yeah, I probably will be done by, 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 that, by that afternoon, yeah. Now, you're writing books, and, and in this case mainly we're talking about Infinite Splendours now, obviously. Yeah. You know, you're writing books with really serious things that yep. are bubbling away under the surface. Yet I imagine, well, I mean, the way I read your work, you know, you're not, you're not like slapping us in the face with a message. You're not telling us this is no. what we think. No. Yet no. you must think something or some part of you must think something as you're writing it. How do you find that balance as a writer? Well, as I, me as a writer is a different person to me in real life. Tell us about that. Oh, me in real life is a judgmental, ordinary, oh, difficult person. Me as a writer, and, and George Saunders has written a writing guide recently for any of you who are budding writers or appreciate a, a, a good writing book about writing I don't think there is a better book in the world about writing and and it's called a swim in the pond in the rain and he describes your best writing it's as if it's been written by a more compassionate um a, a, a more compassionate person twin soul sort of a soul twin with a with with um a, a bigger vision a wider vision and a and a, a much better than you are you know, because um, Lawrence isn't black. Uh, my books aren't black and white, are they? Mm. You know, they're... Um, oh, no, you can definitely, yeah. I mean, you see characters do objectionable things yeah. that we feel empathy for yeah. them and we well, understand. Yeah. What but I'm there, not like so. that necessarily in real life. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm an ordinary, you know, I'm ordinary and and le and less than perfect. And um, um, I, 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 I'm horrified in real life. And, and paranoid and 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 um and yet my characters are, f are flawed are really flawed and I, i'm not really allowed um they're not i'm not given the same freedoms as they are if that makes sense yeah i'm very strict very strict yeah but they're flawed in a way that still makes readers like them and and maybe understand yeah. elements yeah. Them. Yeah, I love them. I love them. I think they. I just. Um, I just absolutely adore them. Some of them. So I mean, do you find that exhausting in a way because no. you have created something that is kind of something that you feel like you shouldn't love or couldn't love or I bet you do. I just do. I don't even think about whether I could or should. I just. I just do. I just think about I, when I wrote him. I just thought about him all day. I just adored him. I just adored his height, his talent. His gangly arms and legs, his process, his crankiness, his impatience. I just, his mess, messy, messy, messy. And I just thought he was eccentric and quirky. And I loved his weird cooking, the vegetables that he grew, his big long legs as he walked up the mountain. No, I just, 
yeah, I really felt for I loved him. I really Tell us about his his deepest flaws from your perspective and, and his, his greatest attributes. Well, those that I said, you know, he's a complete mess. He's cranky when he, his brother tries to bring his wife to visit and he's just horrible about it. He has temper tantrums. He has a huge temper tantrum. He just barks at his brother. No, no, get her away. You know, he just, like, imagine being able to behave like that. You know, and the, world, the brother has to take the wife away. Um, so he's not polite. He's a hermit. Um, you know, some people would call them. I don't think of them as flaws. That's just what other people say. This is just him. Mm. He's, um, I love what he eats. Like, he's always eating, yeah, he's, he enjoys all those vegetables that he grows. He's haphazard in his habits, isn't he? Um, and I love the way he, he, he finds a rotting pumpkin in that sort of cool safe. And he thinks, fantastic, he cooks half and draws the other. How great is that? I love him for that. Like, that's just great, you know? Talk about making the most out of a pumpkin. <laughs> so, so, yeah, he's messy. He's messy. There are, like, piles of paper that thick on his floor, covered in boot prints, and he probably changes his sheets once every six months, you know? He's really in pain. He's, in, he's tortured. He's tortured. Um, and so I feel a lot of empathy for that. And he's in my mind, I mean, none of, I'm, not, I'm not being politically correct here, I know, because I find him like an anti-hero. Because in the end, you know, we can't give away anything, but I, he really was very hurt. And mm. in the course of the novel, I mean, Paul is hurt too because Paul loses so much and so does his mum. It's horrible. It's horrible. Horrible, and everyone in that family. I'll get emotional in a minute. It really was the cruelest thing. Um, but it's the most horrible on him, isn't it? Yeah, and and your depth of emotion when you're talking about it is yeah. is beautiful to see, and and just shows the investment that you have in these characters and, yeah. and this process to create these stories. We've talked about art. We've talked about the way you've sort of. Um, you know, infused other literature like Robert Crusoe and, and the inspiration uh, of a teacher. Mm -hmm. Music is something also yeah. that, that has an impact yeah. and plays yeah. an important part. Yeah. Was that another kind of just, oh. Yeah, it just came happened. and fitted, yeah, it came Which along. Which is Madame Butterfly, the opera by yeah. Puccini, right? Yeah. So tell us about that. Is that a piece of music that you've had an association with? I feel or? like I need to lie, you know, to, to give it. <laughs> no, you don't. Tell the truth. I, I really feel like I need to lie. And I've been put on the spot you know, frequently, like, and sometimes on, it'll be like on live radio or something. I really feel like I have to make, give answers that are, um, you know, I think it was like it's been put to me, you know, I must be very, knowledgeable about this piece of music i mean do i tell them they ask you to hum it or something yeah or not. like <laughs> i mean no i you know my character's more knowledgeable than i am uh, um um he's the one that's not or they, or they might say you must love this well not no not necessarily i mean i write a lot of books i can't love everything that's in all of them i just pick things to put in them that that the character i mean in the idea, I, I know enough about the drama of, uh, and the story of the opera to know that it's um, powerful and sad and it's, it's, a, it's a stood the test. It's one of the most famous operas, the most loved operas, very passionate, very terrible story, the, the terrible betrayal. So that, that fitted again. And so I'll stick with it and listen to it a bit. I mean, I'm a, I've got a busy, ordinary life with not much um, babysitting or, fam you know, I'm on the job of parenting these kids all the time, ordinary basketball, going to Coles. Uh, I don't have, I don't have, I've got to get a novel written. I don't, I can't, I'm not listening to uh, Madam Butterfly for 16 hours a day. I'm, I'm listening to Radio National or, yeah, ordinary. Going, yeah. We've talked about, you know, the, the sense that you're not writing to slap people in the face with a message yet. You know there is a message there infused on on the pages that that people can take as they like i guess depending on their own morals and their own perspectives yeah. so when you write a book like this or, or really any book you know is there something in your mind that you're thinking it would be great if people no 
never, 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 okay. never. Not never. even the children's books? Not ever, just, ever, okay. ever. Never. Yeah. Sarah, it would be great if people never. Yeah. Thought even fills me with, like, something that doesn't feel good. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. Because it seems not authentic. I like, don't know. Doing it's something to. It never happens. Of course I'll think, I'll think, oh, God, I'll have hor horrible thoughts like, God, what if this goes really badly and there's a really bad review? That's going to be terrible. Things like that. Yeah. Um, no, I'll just be inside it with Lawrence, knowing what I need to have happen to him, knowing what I need him to do, finding the sentences that best serve. And that is what my preoccupation is, feeling the music of it, if it was an, if it was an opera, you know, the sound getting all the notes in the right place so that my ear, so I'm using an analogy here, a, a good, a useful analogy, if it's a composition to my own delight, my own rightness, it has to, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm composing the a full complex body and the notes will all need to be right for my ear. That's the best I can put it. And then the rest will just have to take care of itself. And the rest, as we all know, you know, it's a difficult, it's a difficult, impossible, unfair world out there. I can't be invested in what it does and doesn't do. I mean, it's it hurts at times, doesn't it? The only, the place where I have the control is the notes. They're my con area where I can control. After such, you know, what you're describing as just a complete full body, mind, heart, every you know, Adam of your being experience, how do you sort of wiggle your way out of that and, well, see, and I, I, the next I'm, project? Well, that experience when I'm doing it, you see, that's easier for me, that world, to slip into it for three hours because I've only ever got sort of three hours, you know, or maybe then a cup of tea. Then Yeah, I don't have long, I don't have nine hours or usually unless I have those little trips away. It's a nice place to go. It's not exhausting. It's not like I might have given you the impression that it's, oh, it's not. It's just quiet. It's easy. It's quiet. It's natural. It's just like, um, imagine if you were, were a musician and you're just in a space going, dun, 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 boom, dun, 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 boom. You're just enjoying it, you know. Then you might go, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, kind of, it's building, it's building. Ah, oh, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. And then you'll check the time. Okay pick up the kids soon da, da, da. and then off you go it's not it's not tiring tiring yeah. is all of you know tiring is life life world dramas difficult times in which we live um you know but I guess I mean you know hearing you talk about yeah the heartbreak and dramas of what was happening in the book I mean that seems that's to... easier than normal heart and normal dramas that's easy okay you you're calling every single shot I'm, call, I'm calling it, I'm deciding it, I'm shaping it, I'm making it exactly what it needs to be to, like, scratch the itch, scratch that itch, just, just, just it's satisfying. It's not scary. In, in, if it is scary, it's scary in an energising way. It, it's not like, li like life, which is scary in, the, <laughs> you know, yeah, parent-teacher meetings or... Um, or finances or marriages or, you know, normal, yeah. Is there a difference in the way you enter and move through and immerse yourself with the writing of the children's books or is it a very similar feeling? I don't know. I'm worried that, like, maybe I'll always worry that infinite splendours and especially with the cover of the book being that beautiful yellow and it's been a while. I didn't write it. I haven't written it now. For and it was so time. pretty too, it says. Yeah. It's, it, yeah, oh, so, it looks so pretty and then it's yeah. so dark. When I look at it, though, um, you know, it's, it's sitting back there. But when I look at it, it feels like a like it was a lovely, uh, you know, con I know it sounds odd, but it's sort of light-filled and intoxicating and lovely. And I don't know, maybe I'll never have that again. But I did have it with the eye of the sheep very intensely and I did have it with the choke very intense and, and and one foot wrong too slightly differently um and definitely the song of lewis carmichael completely completely went there emotionally okay well let's talk about that for a moment because that's yeah. is that your latest children's book i think isn't it no i've just had one out at the end oh. of yeah 
Oh, okay. Well, the one before. Yeah. Um, because I did want to make sure we've got time for questions from the audience. Yeah. So we've got about 15 minutes left. So if there are people who would love to ask Sophie anything about yeah. what we've talked about, Infinite Splendors, the writing process, the creative process, or the children's books or any other book, please yeah. type in the questions now. We'll come to them yeah. soon. So tell us about Lewis Carmichael and then fill me in on the on the one that's just um, come no, out. I, I loved writing the song of Lewis Carmichael. I wrote it in the at the end of 2019 while waiting for um, while Infinite Splendors was with the editor and they were running through it and doing their work. I decided um, rather than just sweating it out, checking the emails every day, going, oh, how much longer? You know, waiting. I'm not good at waiting. I thought that story's been hanging around for about six or seven years. The idea of a boy on the ice looking for a baby and a hot air balloon. It's been around. And uh, it was an act of discipline. I mean, all of it requires discipline, especially the first draft of anything. That's pure discipline. I am, you know, you do have to some days go, I'm hating this. I'd rather go for a walk, but damn it, I'm going to do it. 1,000 words. 1,000 words, Sophie. Do it now. And because I'm a hard taskmaster, and I've got a lot of fear of failure and, uh, um, yeah, that, that makes me do it because I'm uncomfortable enough to live with. Yeah, my mind is difficult to live with a lot of the time. And so if I've done the thousand words, you know, at least I can tick that box. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does the fear of failure get any less with each success that no. you have? Get more. No, no. It's, it's just, it's just, it's, it's even, even fear of failure probably isn't accurate enough. Just a general, a general, um, terrible, fearful sort of, um, just a fearful pessimism, anxiety. Yeah, a, a fearful sort of, yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't feel um, safe or anything. And to have had, to have had, I did, you don't even, re, I know this is going to sound terrible because, because you're, I'm in the life. So I'm just living it. I don't walk around feeling like successful, but that might just be um, an indication of my, um, I mean, that's not true. It, 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 you know, everything holds its counter argument, doesn't it? Because at the same time, clearly I'm, I'm, I'm a confident sort of, I'm confident at the same time, I'm confident. I am confident and I do trust myself in, in another way. So at the very same time I've told your audience and you about these nerves and I am at the very same time clearly pretty confident and I do trust myself and I do very much enjoy my work and I am confident. But that's not confident as in I'm so confident today, confident as in I'm just doing it. Yeah. I, I'm working hard. I'm doing, I'm doing the work. And I can trust my my I trust my writing. I trust my work. Yeah. At the very so the six, time, on. At, well, at the same time as I'm saying I'm trusting my work, I've got a little voice going, but do you, Sophie? Really? Really? Do you? So yeah. there's no clear, I can't even give you, but even like, yeah, you certainly don't trust the future. I've never So is that done. why the six years? Is that why the time span on, on one book? Is that you doubting or just No, no, it? no, no, no. It just there were I was doing other things. Probably had yeah. a kid, probably wrote another adult novel. It just hung around. It didn't go yeah. away. It just yeah. didn't go away. And it was like, I must do that one day. Oh, but okay, I got okay, damn it. I've got probably three months here. I'm gonna do it. I am going to do it. I'm going to, I know the plot. I know he has to get from the suburbs to the Arctic in a hot air balloon. So let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. And yeah, it was just gorgeous story to, to do it, to write. Um, I loved Matthew. I, I loved their relationship, the bird. I, I absolutely um, loved that wise bird and, 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 and his passing broke me really it really upset me. I, I loved loved him, and I loved the I loved the Arctic and Arctic foxes and snow wolves. You know what beautiful animals and. But you made his passing happen, so that we have that thing yeah, that you're passing for the story. It had to happen. Yeah, he had to move and all that. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it was you know, and and I I, I knew from the start early on that it was time. 
And anyway, I had him, um, for me, for me, it was transformation. It was transformation. Yeah. I, I saw him going on, 100% going on. There was no, it was change. It was change. Have you got, have you got a copy of it there that you can hold up to people who yeah, might be looking yeah, for a book yeah, for, yeah. Their, Here we for go. their kids? And then I think we've got some questions that are popping in from the audience. So I want to make sure, yes. Thank you. The Song of Lewis Carmichael, yes. And we'll come back to the latest book in a minute. But I have seen some questions pop up, so I want to make sure that we've got them. Vicky, did you want to read out some of the questions that I saw fly by a moment ago so we make sure people have got time to ask them? We'll just wait for a minute. Yeah. Vicky? I have no water. Hang on. She sorry, might have can a... you hear me now? Yep, we can. Yeah, yep. sorry. Um, the first one is a comment from Kaz. Um, I'm only an amateur writer, but we do get attached to our characters, don't we? And I, I saw that pop up when you were um, talking about um, yeah. how embedded your characters are and how embedded each other are. Yeah. Um, and then another comment from um, Chris. The questioning voice is always there, but the belief that this is a story worth telling is hugely motivating. Which yeah, is very, it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, all, it's all a risk, isn't it? And is there a period, though, that you doubt that, Sophie? Like you yes, said early yes. on, early on you're thinking, you know, what is the central yes. idea? Yeah. How many times before you even get stuff onto the page does that connection to the central idea change because you think the first one may not have been No, strong? not at all, not at all. Okay. Yeah. Something central each and every time will be how it goes okay it, it will there'll be slight changes because it'll be too big a di it'll be a big thing and that you i can't separate the character from the big thing for example um i my first adult novel one foot wrong it came about as a result of a class at rmit a short a, a short story writing class actually where uh, Anya Waldwitz, the short story teacher who has sadly since passed, um, it was crime. We were looking at crime writing that week in the workshop, and I have I I, I didn't take it seriously, um, being a bit of a, a a snob, literary snob. Don't tell anyone. Um, and so Anya advised that writers of crime have to do a fairly have to do a lot of planning. And so our exercise of the day was a, was a plan. Could we come up playfully with a plan for a, a, a story, a crime, a story, a crime story? And I went away and wrote um, a 10 point plan about a girl who was um, kept prisoner, a daughter and, um, and overfed. And um, one, one day wreaks havoc on, on these very religious parents who had imprisoned her all these years. So, and I, I, that was the plan that I read out thinking this is, you know, so over the top and nuts. It, I, I'm, I'm just, I, um, I was just fulfilling the, the, you know, just doing what the teacher had asked and didn't take it seriously. But everyone in my workshop group said, you have to write that novel. So that's a rather long answer to the question, but it's a good example of, so that voice that I came up with, you know, her predicament and her story was there in the very first moments that she's imprisoned and that she will one day, if revenge is the right word, one day there will be balance and it will be bloody. And so, in the, so as soon as I'm beginning her in her voice and her voice was very strong and there immediately, her central, her predicament or her problem, or it's one and the same along with the voice, They're not really separate. Yeah, so the character is not really separate from what will drive the whole plot forward. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, Vicky, I can see some more questions. Yeah. I see maybe a couple of them may have been addressed, so I'll leave it up to you yeah. to read out which yeah. ones you, you read out. Again from uh, Chris, how do you overcome the fear of the big topics that will take you to dark places? I don't, I don't have um, a, a fear of the big topics that will take me to dark places. I do in real life, and I, I, like I said, I'm a I'm paranoid, anxious mess. <laughs> but uh, me as a writer, I, I'm just doing, I, I wouldn't do things that 
filled me that I was resistant to. Life's hard enough. I do things which give me energy and which I find um, compelling, uh, uh, most of all energizing. And, and there's, there's, um, there's a lot of energy in the forbidden, in the closed door. We want to open the closed doors, go inside and spook, spook ourselves. I've, all, I've got that bit of a, you know, I've got that in my um, personality a bit. You know, I'm a bit drawn. I'm a bit drawn, drawn to it. At the same time as absolutely, you know, squealing in horror. I watch scary movies and hate love it, you know, like a lot of us, I suppose. But you no, know, I mean, I'm, I, that's a playful way to answer. Um, I, I, I can't even give you pat answers as to why I seem to look. I mean, I do write a lot of different sorts of books, and I don't want any of. I, I don't want limitations into the areas that are that I can go. I, I'm, I'm giving you a rather rambling answer. Maybe there just isn't a neat one. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot that came out of that answer yeah. anyway. Yeah. Vicky, yeah. some um, of the questions I've seen pop yeah. up. At Sophie, yeah. So, are you conscious of the genre? That, yeah. yeah. Are you conscious of the genre you set out to write, and do you approach adult and children's books differently? Well, Touched upon. Well, um, you know, I'll have an idea for a character, say a boy who struggles at school. And what will my interest, I want him to go to the Arctic in an air balloon. Now I'll know, that sensible part of me will know that children will really, I mean, adults will love that too, but, but I'll go, I'll, I'll think, okay, that's going to be marketed as a children's book. Now I'm not interested in Matthew's story. I'm interested in his journey to the Arctic and a blackbird. I'm not interested in his story. It's not about, it's not about, physical abuse or sexual abuse, <laughs> it's about a trip to the Arctic. There's no worries there about is it for children or is it for ad adults. That's, does that make sort of sense what I'm trying to say? It's, it's, it's a story where um, my responsibility is to shape a story about um, flight through the, you know, to the Arctic in a hot air balloon. I, um, the process is challenging, but not because the reader is ultimately eight or 80, but because this story has its own set of demands, vocabulary, its own rhythm, and that is always work, lots of work, but not because he's just got a different trauma. I think everybody's got trauma and his is his own and he struggles away and he's pretty isolated. I'm interested often um, in the outsider, experience of the outsider because I seem to go back there, I'm drawn back there time and time again. And I think there's a, a, a healing and it's cathartic to keep working it. But, but it's not whether the age of the reader, because I'm the reader. I'm the only reader and I'm doing, uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm working as hard as I can to shape the thing to its natural right thing that it wants to be. Huh. Vicky, we've probably got time for two more questions. Yep. If you There's wanna... one sitting there from Margaret. Oh, yep. um, how much of your writing is planned and how much writes itself in a way? It doesn't write itself and it is all planned. It's all planned from the early, from the, from uh, as soon as bloody possible because it's like going somewhere, um, you know, I used to, you know, have a, I used to use the Melways everywhere I went. And I was pretty good at that Melways. I couldn't believe it. Do you know if you follow the Melways, you never get lost? It was just as good as a GPS. It was incredible. Because I did a lot of, um, I, I ran a lot of children's fairy parties and so I needed to get to all sorts of places and I was always using that Melways. I like a map and you'd look at it before you left. You didn't just wing it and, and look at it street by street. You'd, you'd have looked up the town and you'd, yeah. I mean, that's a funny analogy, but. No, I, everything's planned, but if you, but it's a, it's a loose, alive kind of a plan. It's not page five, you know, the doctor will enter the room and, and no, it's not like that. It's like one, the kids are living with their mum. Two, it's going well, they meet a cow. It, it, it's a bit loose, but it'll have a, I'll know 
basically where I'm going. Yeah, from early on. I, li I like to know where the hell I'm going in this crazy world. See how I'm getting silly now? I, I get silly at a certain, like, because I don't work at night. So <laughs> That's okay. You've only got two more minutes. I'm, I'm so going to stay on. mature. I'm going to stay on, mature for two more minutes. Vicky. There's probably not time for another there, question. There Sarah, isn't another question. That's okay. Well, I've got a question yeah. because we're being silly and we're talking about children's books, which yeah. of course aren't always silly. Sometimes no, they're no, very no, no, they're not, at all. not at all. Cool. That was my attempt at a good segue and it actually that's A good segue. Well, I was trying to segue for you to hold up the name of the book that I didn't know existed, just like Vicky when she introduced me said that I was married with a partner and living with four children. I am divorced happily. I thought so so get rid of the partner off my bio, Vicky, next time. Get that partner off your bio. He's gone. gone. He's gone. <laughs> but, oh, and, no, and no. Sophie can Where show are my Halloween's? I think my husband. Oh, just tell us the name of it then. We can no, no, it. no, no, here. <laughs> The House on Pleasant Street. Ah, a picture book. Yeah. Okay, and that just came out? Yeah. 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 I'll show and you so very quickly, you know, because I don't want to offend you, but I'm sure you I will. You won't offend me. Because, no, but because you offend the classic me. thing that people say about picture books, yeah. oh, there's only, you know, 107 words on the whole thing. Was that yeah. really easy to write? Well, they're, they're, they're essential that, you know, something either arrives as a picture book or it doesn't. And it's a, it's a strong, solid sort of wholly formed thing that just naturally must fit within, you know, because picture books have quite, there's a lot that shouldn't be a picture book and a lot that can't be a picture book. And if it does feel like it could be, you'll know. I mean, that's not necessarily a very technical answer. You'll just feel. Uh, yeah, that's the shape. That's the right. It's a 32-page spread. It's like a poem. It's not a poem. It's a picture book text. And they're different things too. Although when you're older, did begin as a poem. That, that's a picture book that came out in March but was contracted for publication uh, eight years, seven years ago. It came out in March. That came, began its journey as a poem. So maybe maybe they're more like poems. Well, certainly that that one was, um, and the publisher had the had the imagination to see how well it might work for a picture book, and so it became. Tick tick. It is seven thirty. <laughs> Sophie. I love listening to you talk about writing and I'm sure everyone who's in the chat feels the same way. We've gone from dark and all, we've gone everywhere to the Grampians, to, to picture books and into your mind, which is a fascating place. And we've only had a glimpse, we've only had a glimpse of it. So thank, you. So. thank you. Thank you, Claire. Looking. It's been so um, fantastic to speak with you. I can't believe we haven't spoken till now and I think we should make sure it happens again because it's been really enjoyable for me also. We Thank did you. speak once a long time ago but it was very brief. Was it, it was children? The Bayside, no, it was, at a, it was at the Bayside Writers Festival many, many moons ago but yes. And uh, did I have kids yet? Probably not. Maybe we'll not. Blame it on those. Yeah. Well, let's, um, let's make it happen again because... Um, I've I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed speaking with you and thank you. Thank you. So thank, thank you again, Sophie. Thanks to everyone who's joined us tonight. Thanks to Vicky thank you, from the library for thanks, curating. Vicky. Thank you. And thanks to the magical collaboration of libraries that I'm not going to remember, yeah. but regional Victoria libraries rock. Support your libraries <laughs> because they make things like this possible and support authors. Yeah.